As you may have known in my last video, I straight up watashi would my hunter's ass straight to the DCV with extreme prejudice. And my warlock has been around since the literal dawn of destiny, even if at the moment he ain't exactly looking like it. So to me, the choice was obvious. My hunter had to go. And with tears in my eyes and a heavy heart, I sent him to the DCV with Cade and the bad forcer memes. I probably should have put my gear into the vault before I did that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even blink as I sent my boy to Bungie Limbo. I don't even take his inventory out and as a result have been left with crippling sadness. And now in my challenge runs I've consistently avoided playing Hunter as I'm a warlock at heart and the Shattered Eye of Meta has forever put up walls that are just slightly higher than the Stompy's high jump around my heart. But one of my favorite playstyles in this game may come as a shock to you but I actually love the throwing knives in Destiny. There's something so pure in the way you can just consistently chuck knives as long as you're on target. It's a super satisfying playstyle. I had the idea for a challenge run of only using powered melees and eventually only unpowered Melees, but in order to give myself, I mean, Savathun a break from constantly showing up at her door like Buenos dias, you big green bitch. I'm sorry, baby. You know I love you. <laughs> I decided that I would instead turn my attention to the ever-neglected Aramis. But with this being the perfect opportunity to regain a hunter on my character roster that has been oh so empty without one, I knew what I had to do. So sharpen your blades and accidentally kick yourself from your own Discord, chuckle nuts, because that's right, baby. Today I'm posing the question: Can you beat Beyond Light using only powered melees? Before we get started though, look at this shit. This is actually my desktop background. It is absolutely 100% as offensive on the eyes as it looks whenever it gets dark. But I enter the character creation screen and decide to go with an exo as my last hunter was an exo and Cade grief is odd because the pain, the pain never really goes away. I'm just kidding, it's because I have one of each of my character screen as I'm a believer in balance. Unless that balance messes with my broken toys. No, I'm not upset at Warlock Solar 3.0 or anything. Definitely not bitter. I opt to give him maximum forehead to hide the fact that I've got no brain power behind this metal exterior and paint him with only the most beautiful and primest of Highly reloaded Hot Wheels colors. I then watched the amazing opening cutscene to Destiny where Elon Musk and friends travel towards the giant reality warping space entity that is currently terraforming the planet with a fucking M4. A godlike entity. Bring gun. America. I think this is one of the strongest scenes in this game. It's showing you how far the original fire team traveled on the surface of the planet that hasn't even been set foot on yet. I've constantly said in my videos, destiny is at its best when you feel small in a universe that feels much bigger than you. And this opening scene highlights that really well. And while humanity is still small and very insignificant in the grand scheme of destiny's universe, the journey you're about to set foot on is not. This scene is absolutely beautiful and the music is timeless as well. I am then arisen from the dead in the ruins of the old cosmodrome. Since this is old Russian, I was buried in a pile of cars, we can only assume that I was killed by driving without a dash cam. I then crack my knuckles to circulate the G-fuel inside of my sweaty hunter hands, and open my subclass menu to take a look at if I can start this run right away, but I'm immediately hit with the regret of deleting my old hunter for the previous challenge run, as I have once again returned to a D2 pleb, where everything is locked. Disregarding that for now, I begin running like an Olympic sprinter, which is pretty good for a centuries old dead guy. I then watch all the fallen in this wall being very creepy and hiding in the dark. I kinda miss when they were strange and threatening like this, but I guess after eight years of genociding their people, now I can't help but feel bad for them. Their whole culture, structure, and houses decimated chasing after the great machine. It's truly and absolutely tragic. Anyways, I then unlock my throwing knives and fucking obliterate the first drag I see. The game then tells me to use my super, but that wouldn't be very challenge run of me and I start legging it past all the enemies. Ooh, ooh After running away like the fanatic in the new Severance mission with Aldrin. I just love how he's like, oh shit, I know how this one goes and then just fucking legs it. Don't worry, I'll watch from the window. Yeah, kick his ass. <laughs> Learned from last time, if I just sit in the middle of the room, I'm gonna get ice. <laughs> Gonna have to try harder, asshole! My immunity fades! And then greeted by a mysterious figure who's ready to lend a helping hand. I'm sure this badass yet helpful character with bones on his shoulder definitely doesn't look like a Fortnite character, or a troll doll, or that nerd from Paw Patrol. Man, your hand ain't shit. Back in my day, we didn't need help getting to the last city. I got myself to safety while being chased by a powerful fallen archon. Bad! Bad Shahan, you get no dawning cookies. Just looking at you fills me with rage. After leaving the general vicinity of Shahan and feeling the testosterone return to my body, I realized I don't actually have to do the new light quest. Just like my hunter before him, I can leave this quest as a permanent reminder on my directory and just go to the tower. I don't even have a ship yet, but no, my chuckle nut glory, here I stand. I immediately beeline it to Ikora to become goaded with powers and create a build that's useful for this challenge. Old habits die hard and I run to Hawthorne accidentally. It's never quit. Realizing what I've done, I leap towards Ikora to learn my new abilities. For once, Papa Rai is is maxed out on glimmer and ready to revel in the fat stacks. 7,500 for a super? Not a problem. 1,000 for class abilities? Huh. <laughs> 
They're practically giving them away. 3,000 for additional grenades? More like 3,000 is easily paid. 25,000 for- Holy fuck me. <laughs> Making poor financial decisions, both in the real world and in game, I am once again broke on Glimmer. I meditate on the poor choices that got me here and obtain my Zenkai boost. I then head to the vault to look for the remnants of my old hunter, and to my surprise, a set of deep stone legacy armor yet lingers. I grab the armor and also snag the sixth coyote and the Aphidius Spathe exotic. And upon entering my inventory to equip it all, I am greeted by no hunter, only boot. I gear up and realize that I have no idea how to become styling as a hunter since I've been a pure warlock main since 2014 with brief breaks to Titan and wind up throwing this together. After being proud of my generic ass hunter, I slap on the highest honor I can bestow upon an armor set, that being the Grand Luster Shader. I then equip the weighted throwing knife, knock him down for the Radiant Regen, and on your mark, I then apply all the fragments that just bankrupted me as hunters have an insane amount of fragments and I put on all the ones that I could afford. Looking at the amount of customization and love put into the hunter's solar 3.0 saddens me as I realize that Bungie had indeed wiped their ass with my warlock subclass, kicking me in the nuts on the way out the door. One last gift from Luke Smith. <laughs> no, I'm not bitter or anything. You know, I have no idea how effective this build is, but in true Riley Reloaded fashion, I'm going in raw and we'll deal with whatever problems come head on. With our build finally set up, it was finally time to begin Beyond Light. Upon loading into the first mission of Beyond Light, I watch Varix limp away into the old comm station to send out a distress signal, and while his back is turned, Elsie shows up to steal Varix's shard of darkness. Fun fact about Elsie, you can find a dead exo that is sad that her one-size-fits-all body doesn't compare to Elsie's that matched her original form, meaning that while Elsie has always been packing more cake than a Pixar mom, she probably had to avoid psychotic lads staring at her throughout her previous life. Only this time, they're functionally immortal, deranged, and named Riley Reloaded. Varix then realized that he's been had as Aramis's group of fallen show up to teach him about the dangers of urban violence. Ghost and I are dramatically looking off into the distance after answering a call from the darkness to investigate the frigid moon. We then receive a distress call from Varix to investigate, and when I ask Ghost where the signal is coming from, he says, Here, Europa. Well, no shit, that's like saying, where's my local McDonald's, and somebody says, Earth, dumbass! But despite being clowned on by my ghost, I run to investigate the signal, and get to watch as a fallen catch rolls in. I love these ships, and I'm always happy to see them. We had one in the city during Season of the Splicer that I would have loved to be able to see from the tower. My new build works pretty well as long as I land my knife. I'm able to completely recharge my melee. I have Acrobat Dodge on to completely recharge it. If I whiff a knife and a dodge, I can still recover. I roll in and begin slinging knives left and right with deadly accuracy, until I throw this knife. <laughs> I have no idea what happened, I was completely on target, and then just decided to yeet it in a completely different direction. I contemplate if continuing living is worth it, while the fallen pelt me in the ass with arc shots and then take cover behind a rock. I knife the remaining fallen with style and expertise, bust a move while my ghost scans the terminal. Upon getting into the next fight with the fallen, I start slinging knives once again. I'm an unstoppable killing machine, I've got the aim of a demigod. Definitely not controller assist or anything, but I'm popping heads left and right. I kill the servitors, then the last captain, and continue towards Varix. Aramis walks up like a G and fades Varix with the mightiest of pimp hands, the ultimate sign of disrespect. She then encases him in ice, and upon asking him for the good stuff, she takes his arms once again. Things just don't go your way, do they, Varix? I then open my inventory and realize that I don't have a heavy weapon, limiting my power level. But in this game, the only thing that I fear are stealth screeds and being told by my subs that watch my Can You Beat the Witch Queen Without Double Jumping video that I won't die from any height as long as I land on flat ground. Trying to get me to kill myself? Nice try, fed boys. But I miss my throwing knife in the shank, and when I go to roll to regain my charge, I'm out of range. I bust it down on top of the vent while my dodge recharges. I clear out the remaining enemies from around Varix and show him the power power of spin jitsu, and then chuck a knife at his ice. It didn't break the ice, and while waiting for my knife to cool down, I decided it'd be a good idea to mod out my gear. I swap my gauntlets to stasis to get the kickstarter mod, I then mod immobility to increase the recharge rate of my dodge. Coming out of my inventory, I hope the ice doesn't regenerate health and throw another knife at it. Thankfully, Bungie was with me and breaking Varix free, he then scatters and the fallen return to fight me once again, this time bringing a mech suit to take on the immortal god slayer with sanity problems. I dodge to regain my knife, and upon throwing it at the vandal on top of this canister, he just instant transmissions away, leaving me with mass confusion. I chuck knives at the brig, constantly ducking whenever I run out of charges, allowing them to cool down. Dodging near the brig to regain your knife also usually results in a stomp mechanic launching you, but after blowing the front panel off and exposing the circuitry, the brig becomes much easier. I throw many knives and kill the brig, saving Varix's life. We then speak to Varix, where he tells me that Aramis has stolen the evil power of the only McDonald's ice cream machine that actually works and is now using it to convince the majority of Elixney to join her army by way of sweet treats. This simply won't fly, because being a Chad warrior of the light means that whenever there's something in the soul system doing anything slightly annoying to the vanguard, they send in a single guy instead of using actual army tactics to deal with the paracausal threats, even if that threat poses a significant risk to existence itself, but hey, what better way to stop basically another god than with bullets? Anyways, I finish talking to Varix, hit the banner, and begin the new Kel mission. Upon starting, I, I try to whip out my sparrow, but I'm once again forced to walk by the fact that I didn't complete the new light quest in order to avoid having to talk to Shaw Han and begin to leg it, something I'll be doing a lot because Bungie likes to put everything on the other side of the map in this DLC. <laughs> oh god. So much walking.
On my way up to Reese Reborn, I start throwing crack knives, hitting every enemy in the cranium. My build basically ensures that I always have a knife or dodge to refill my knife, and Papa Ryu ain't a bad shot in the slightest. I hone my edge Gordon Ramsay style on their temples on the way up, and upon reaching the top of the stairs, I realize that I have no knife or dodges, so I retreat down the stairs until I'm recharged. Getting a little brave on the bridge, I stroll too close to a tripwire and wind up getting laid clean out. I resurrect all the way at the bottom of my climb without any dodges or melee charges, and begin waiting. None of the shanks have spotted me yet. Little did they know, a deranged god killer is sitting three feet beside them. They must have smelled my farts or something because they suddenly spring into action. But little do they know that I'm the fastest hand in the West and I once again decimating the poor Elixney population for no other reasons than I don't like them using darkness. I return to the bridge, knife the dregs and vandals, and then hammer the shank with knives. I coax these exploder shanks into blowing up. After clearing the room, a swarm of vandals with sticks chase me. I dark souls roll away and hit them with the primus of 360 no scopes. Aramis then reflects on how they become pawns to just chasing the great machine and completely freezes this poor servant are just chilling in the back of the room. He was probably just thinking, wow, what a great day. I get to hang out with the Kel as she addresses the people. Truly, I'm moving up in the world, but instead my man just gets fucking vaporized with the Bruce Lee punch. She then says her enemies will feel our pain, but guaranteed ours is worse, as I'm an immortal being that's tethered to game modes like Gallahorn the game mode. The game then wants me to freak out about the dangers of urban violence and run away from the dark powers of the Kel, but I'm feeling my knife slinging oats. And there's a group of brave wretches charging me with their poles. I knock them down one by one, really feeling the solar capability of a hunter. I whiff a knife and this wretch sneaks up behind me. I pull some hunter crucible tactics and spaz out all over the arena even though the damage I took was the equivalent of holding back a really good sneeze. I blast my way out of there with perfect knives and ooh look a ship. I didn't even know I had a ship because I left before I could finish the new light quest but apparently I do. Varix then told me that Aramis is crazy and she needs to go down. I don't know what you want from me Varix. I just work here. I then get to witness this amazing cutscene with the drifter, Eris and the exo stranger all utilizing the power of stasis to decimate yet another band of fallen. While this cutscene is awesome because we've been hyping up the allure of the darkness and the drifter for a while, they don't really play a big part in this DLC at all, which the marketing made me think I'd be going on grade A adventures with Daddy Drifter in the Dark Vanguard, but instead they only chill out at the camp twice and never really play a bigger role. Darkness sends down a ziggurat, which we will use to advance the attunement of our dark powers. The stranger tells me to go commune with the darkness, so I run towards the marker in hopes of getting Jiggy in the Ziggy, but all it does is tell me to go somewhere else. Alright, let's see how far away this next part is. Can't be that bad. Well, shit. <laughs> well, if I'm gonna have to hoof it, let's at least make it a memorable journey. a long walk. Must have got lost in a couple of places back there. That was both a joke and a love letter to how gorgeous destiny can be at times. I tend to miss these things when I'm constantly chasing loot and flying around the solar system at fucking Mach 8, but taking a moment to see how much love and care the Bungie art team puts into nearly every environment truly is stunning. This is a gorgeous game indeed, and sometimes you just need to slow down a little bit to appreciate all the hard work and effort that went into creating this sort of stuff. Anyways, I get frozen at the crux and initiate the diarrhea stance, and upon breaking free of sore tummy, I find that I have the ability to sling off ice shurikens that deal big damage. This melee is just bouncing off of everything, killing them very quickly. Believe it or not, this is the first time doing Beyond Light on a character that isn't my warlock. And of course, 
Here I am, not even using the whole kit. <laughs> These shurikens are extremely fun to use, but since this is Riley Reloaded and we're only supposed to torture ourselves, after clearing the enemies, the darkness crushes me like a soda can. <laughs> I then knife some fallen, open a chest to finish this part of the quest, and upon teleporting back to Sharon's Crossing to talk to Varix, I notice two titans. One is doing the cat ear dance and the other has the slow dance emote, but they set themselves up so it cancels the animation, meaning I'll never get to experience true love. There's a shit ton of sparrows outside of Varix's garage. It would be almost criminal if I didn't place my own here. Oh yeah, that's right. I've been walking everywhere. <laughs> Varix tells me to slap around some fallen in the Eventide ruins to draw the lieutenant of Aramis. Only problem is that I'm not allowed to have the fast travel point, which means I'll be once again walking. And when I get there, I once again commit war crimes and or genocide upon the Elixni people. At this point, I just can't help but feel bad for them. But upon cleaning them up, I get a bead on one of Aramis's entourage. Phalanx. I once again run a good few kilometers. Source, am Canadian. I clear out the fallen until it lures in some brigs. Any enemy in this run that can survive one or two knives is a problem because I have to wait until my gear recharges. Extending the length of this fight. I eventually did find a method where if I get precision hits against an enemy, it will recharge my dodges. So I can throw a knife, dodge near an enemy, get my knife back, then use that knife to kill that enemy with a precision hit, and it will refresh both of my dodges, allowing me to get three more knives at a quicker rate. After defeating the Briggs, it drops down one of Phalanx's warriors. These stasis elixni consistently freeze me in place. This fight took a while because just like before, I have to wait for my things to recharge, but after about 20 minutes, I kill the boss and head to the banner that starts the warrior mission. I load in and normally would just take off at Mach 8 down the tunnel, but the only thing that would happen in Witty Pimp is that I forgot my wheels. So it was once again time to run another marathon. The wyvern in the opening section is not afraid to spread my cheeks, but here comes Papa Rai spazzing out all over the room. I'm beginning to understand the hunter mindset. For some reason in this class, I feel a lot more meme as though I want to emote at every slight victory, flip out at the slightest sign of danger. And for some reason, the pain of loss hits a little different, you know what I'm saying? But I chuck the last knife and shatter the cursed harpy with legs, corporeal form. I knife the tesseract and do surprisingly well at floating shanks. Normally, even if they're coming right at me, I like to ram my forehead through them, but I've embraced the evadey boy inside. I throw a knife at the heavy shank, but it's not enough to kill it. Alright, I guess I'll just relax at the bottom here. In the next room, Bungie decides to drop kick me in the nipples by putting out one but two harpies in the next room that are all capable of surviving my knives. So I'm once again forced to tactically relax until my knife recharges. Then for some reason, I'm possessed by the spirit of interpretive dance and begin busting it down, even though I'm knee-deep in enemy territory and on my last brain cell. That's not enough to stop Papa Rai from finally putting down the last of the enemies. Waiting on the cooldowns doesn't make me feel a very good inside, so the depression takes over. I try to dodge near the conflicts to regain a charge, but sadly it's not a real living thing, so I'm forced to wait. I regain my knife, destroy the all spark, and continue to the fight before Phalanx. I feel so agile as a hunter that I'm maneuvering around the room, making way more dodges than I need to to complete this fight. I'm dipping, ducking, and diving through the air and manage to land this stylish knife on the brig. Once again, the need for meme takes over, and I emote in the general of the Dark Elixni Empire. I guess she really couldn't handle the Neutron style and tries to stomp me away, harder mommy. But I clean up the little enemies and begin sentencing her to death by way of a thousand knives to the temples. You may have noticed I have this trick where I flick my camera away when an enemy is close to me and then spin around while the throw is charging up. That's so I don't accidentally melee them with an unpowered melee. Now I know there are ways to keybind uncharged and charge melees, but I'm a freak of nature playing on PC but using an Xbox controller. Everyone knows that Xbox controllers are for those with big freakish ogre hands. Now, we can all make fun of the hands all we want, but at least we all know that Shrek was absolutely packing down there. What does that have to do with me? I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, in the second area, I'm free to chuck knives at the shanks, then slowly pick off the boss until she runs into the final arena. I fight off the little enemies with many tight knife throws, and for showing off my skill and expertise, the pyramid imbues me with the power of slurpy brain freeze. Bad news for the boss because these ice shurikens are not afraid to fade the boss in seconds. Fun to use as well. Looks like the verdict is in, and the jury has sentenced phalanx to frosty nipples. I drop a Jojo pose to show absolute dominance and beat the warrior with only a powered melee. I return to talk to the stranger who wants to give me mentorship by saying, hey, go talk to the shard in the ziggurat. My ghost tells me that this feels wrong. I mean, I did just immediately rise from the dead, and instead of even becoming learned in the ways of the light, I dipped out and began wielding the darkness almost immediately. <laughs> I'm literally about four hours out of the grave at this point. Now I'm no expert, but I think the vanguard is slipping a little bit. <laughs> but next up was to attune my powers inside of the Bray Exoscience. I look at all the sparrows and have flashbacks to a happier time when I didn't have to walk everywhere. I sadly push over the sparrow in sorrowful remembrance and begin legging it towards Bray Exoscience. I show up and thankfully the crux is right in the entryway and it gives me the power of the most biting cold known to man. The power of sleeping with a fan on and your toes out of the blanket. Truly psychotic. I whip shurikens off left and right and embrace my inner ice ninja. I clear the room and for showing off my power, the darkness crux fucking aura me. I then speak to Varix and he tells me to go after the Technocrat by killing some Vex to get tracking modules. I collect them which leads me to a Vex conflux to decode. For some reason I style on this droid in the air. 
Wow, that was horrifying. I begin decoding the terminal. The game sends a myriad of vex after me, but that's nothing a little knife foo can't handle, and I clear the first terminal. I use the knife to hit the crystal in the sky, which causes the next wave to begin. I clear it out and destroy the crystal with this grade A knife throw. Maybe my career in the NBA isn't over, but after destroying the last crystal, it summons in a servitor that teleports us away. But thankfully, in my darkest moment, a hero had come to my aid. Squid Billy came out of nowhere to do my dirty work for me. By once again using the power of unpaid labor, I stand idly by as the Chad Squid Billy rolls in like an angel of death and clears out my enemies for me. I then run after Squid Billy, firing my gun to get his attention because I wanted to show my respect. This was indeed my favorite arc in the anime. When things are looking dim because I'm lazy and don't want to wait around while my knives recharge, in came Squid Billy to carry me. And with the servitor defeated, it was time to take down Praxis. I kill the brig in the beginning section and clear out the little enemies. Once the shield wall goes down, I chuck a knife at the traps to destroy them. The room lights up like a Christmas tree. At this servitor, I have to wait for my knives to recharge and wind up being here for about 10 minutes, using my dodge when I can and picking off the enemies with precision when they stray a little too far away from the servitor and I move on to the next area. Now this is something that all the hunter mains out there are gonna clown on me good for. Since I've been a warlock main for the better part of eight years, I don't exactly know the limits of the hunter abilities. I really honestly thought that I could dodge through these tripwire traps. You could even see me contemplating it like, yeah, I can make it. <laughs> I could not make it. So it would appear that the dodge does have some limitations. I continue my reign of death and find myself inside of a room full of what I assume are exo brain scans. To think that in this facility there is a perfect brain scan of the original Cade, and even better yet, an original copy of my brother's exo, Dysius Jin. It's a neat thought to think that the collective lives of all the exos in existence are somewhere around here. I Jojo pose under Praxis and two shot or shield transmitter, do some stylish jumping and dodging, and land every knife throw on these wretches chasing me. The next room goes pretty much the same as I've embraced my inner knife man and realized that this place style is actually pretty fun when you've been a floaty boy for about eight years. I run past all the vandal snipers, and thinking I had burst glide on, I hurl myself into the abyss. We got years of academy training to unlearn here, boys. I return and hit a triple-double on the gambler's run, giving myself a victory royale. As to what that actually means, your guess is as good as mine, but with my forehead fully gamer greased, I was ready to take on Praxis. The same type of principle applies here. Hit the boss with a knife, dodge, and hit him again. Then use your last dodge to regain your knife on the smaller enemies, and use a precision hit to fully recharge your knives and dodges. Then I just whittle the boss down slowly. After some time, I manage to lower the boss's health to the point where the crux gives me the go-go juice once again and I gain the power of accidentally cutting the sides of your lips in a freezy, meaning I was about to be bringing the critical damage. I start throwing shurikens and upon freezing Praxis, I stand by while for some reason she just fucking explodes. It's obviously a skill issue. In this darkness industry, you either bust a nut or the nut busts you. I'm sorry about that one once again. It's late when I'm writing this. But with Praxis out of the way, we get to witness Aramis have a little bit of a mental breakdown. She sends Atrax to the crypts to retrieve Tanix for the hundredth time. Imagine you just resurrect from being dead for a long time and the last thing you get to see is the exact same guy who killed you walking in during a raid? That's right! I've returned once again to take you to Flavortown. But with Aramis down another general, it was time to take on Bacris and rip his face off and Elmer's glue it to the front of the helmet. Kinda messed up for a T-14 raiding bungo, but at least it looks cool. I then return to the stranger's tent where Zavala tells me that I've been a bad boy for using the thing that we've been fighting against for the better part of many centuries. I try to apologize by phasing into his body at dick hype, but he turns away from me in disappointment and that's when I see it. Damn it, Bungie's sending me back to talk to Shaw Han. I thought I escaped his yee yee ass. Apparently I'm not allowed to go to the Cosmodrome until I finish the Schism mission. Thankfully I'm significantly more powerful than I was when I was here last thanks to build crafting and having access to Solar 3.0 right after my resurrection. I'm still suffering many days after from lack of glimmer but thankfully I can blast my way through this mission. It was still about 20 minute detour away from the campaign but after completing it I get the quest to kill the Fallen and the Divide in order to get the transmitter parts. I gather the good stuff and it was finally time to cut the face off of Bacris. I steamroll this lost sector as I've become proficient with the knives throughout my training in the UK and was finally nearing perfect mastery. The crux empowers me once again and I make short work of this room. Bacris is finished off easily and I move on to the glassway strike. This strike has me following Onyx 077 and AOD King's Doom as they do everything for me. Funny thing is, if you see a guy named Embracing Fate just following you around not doing anything, I am 100% taking advantage of your free labor as you clear things for me in a challenge run. These two A tier lads cleaned up most of the strike while I sat idly by for revives and moral support. I glow stick shadow boxes they do all the real fighting, watch as they finish off the boss for me, and instead of letting me have my loot, Bungie sends my ass straight to cutscene for being the only useful member on the strike team. It's sad when you see the devastation of the Elixni people and the reason they're so dogmatic in their approach to everything. Not only have they been chasing after the thing that left them for dead, they also found the planet where it blessed another race that began collectively exterminating their culture and ways of life. Anyway, I've, I've gone too deep already by planting a knife into the skull of almost every Elixni I've encountered at this point, so I need to push the war crimes out of my mind for the time being. After all, I'm a hunter of the last city, one of the traveler's most memeiest guys. Oh. Yeah, let the genius hunter do all the fucking work. See ya!
<laughs> the stranger tells me that the darkness twists up my desires inside. Must be why, even though I complain about microtransactions all the time, I've still bought my fair share of it. I'm definitely part of the problem. Darkness has me. Send help. I then talk to the drifter whose mouth moves so unnaturally. Dear God, stop, man. <laughs> it's gross to look at. I then think, wait a minute. I picked up a power weapon and it made it so that spot was unlocked. Could I just recall a sparrow and not have to unlock one? And oh my God, so much walking. Wasted. But I rip on over to the ziggurat to demand my money. And I am tasked with ascending the new city of the fallen empire to commune with a crew. After achieving my powers, I slap this room silly and defeat the boss inside. Then the darkness squeezes me like a Capri Sun and I return to Varix to plan out our next move. He tells me to go rescue his friends, the elixir that aren't warmongering so they can go join the House of Light, baby! Before Season of the Splicer even rolled around, I was knee-deep in the Mithrax lore. He couldn't shit without me knowing about it. I was basically a lore master like Bife, but instead for privacy invasion. During the Festival of the Lost before Splicer, I wore the Mithrax mask, chanting House Light, House Light. I begin disabling the tractor beams holding the skiff in place. Place. I thought I'd have to spend a lot of time fighting the bosses that come down, but once again, I'm spared that fate by being able to freeload off of hard-working guardians like a politician. And JJ Slayer, 1007, showed up to deal with all my problems for me. S-tier D2 community in this run. Even though the D2 community can be a toxic and spiteful place, at least we can all take solace in the one thing that binds us together. Makes us brothers and sisters. Exploiting our fellow man. Yeah! Free labor, baby! I mean, teamwork am amongst free roam players. Yeah. We free the skiff for Mithrax to take a huge gamble and ask the guardians to let them into the city in Season of the Splicer. Honestly, a really dangerous play to make as many guardians are ready to throw hands the moment they see a drag. One thing I find neat in the lore is that an Elixni captain is actually the height that Elixni are supposed to be. The ones that are giant just took all the ether for themselves. I realize that it's dumb to be running two sniper rifles because they slow movement down so I move to a faster frame weapon and get ready to take on the Kell of Darkness. I blast through the enemies on my way up the tower. My health may constantly be in the red, but I'm quick on my toes. There's a brig in the bridge and while I wait for my knives to recharge, I give them the old glow stick treatment. Absolutely. Absolutely disrespectful. I then realized that I can tactically run away from this fight and I leg it past them. The boss in this room has shields. My plan was to charge up all three knives so I can hit them with a maximum volley, but that caused me to have to wait for a long time in order to get anything done. I was here for about 20 minutes, sitting on my chair a good couple of times while waiting, but in the end I still managed to polish off the boss and began my fight with the brig. This isn't all that bad. I just dodge and allow my knives to charge. After the front plate is gone, the brig is basically a cakewalk. Upon walking into this room, this guy is standing here like, you absolute turd monkey, you'll never get past my impenetrable defense. Fences. But little does he know I've been trained in the arts of ass kiku and I'm not afraid to implant my foot inside his assenholen. I have never spanked the general so hard in my life. Really impressive stance for someone who got faded in two knives by a mentally deranged lunatic with many knives. And here we are. I stand at the foot of the final showdown with Aramis. Little does she know I've been honing my retard for the better part of three months fighting the Witch Queen with the silliest means known to man. Now as the traveler's most stubbornest guy, I've finally shown up to punch Aramis's ticket. I really wish this campaign had a legendary edition so I could put myself through real pain like all you sick people enjoy. But fighting Aramis isn't actually that bad. The enemies in this room constantly respawn so you can just rinse and repeat until she hits about half health. She looks at me and says, you're strong but you're still a nerd and she freezes me to the linoleum. My guy looks towards his ghost and goes, help! But the ghost says, sorry bro, no idea what to do here. Peace! Oh yeah, well maybe this'll work. To which Aramis says, boy, give me that shit. Running out of options, I decide, alright, fuck it, power within or something. And I take up the power stance like that wasn't the scariest moment of my short new life. But with nipples fully erect as the power of stasis flows through me to begin my icy massacre. Aramis doesn't stand the slightest chance, and I take her down with very few shurikens. Honestly impressive how few it took. But she goes into a recovery phase. I walk up to look my enemy in the eye, but she laid a trap for me, springs back up and launches me as the cutscene begins. Aramis freezes herself in an effort to stay alive or something. Not quite sure why she froze up there. I then return to the Exo Stranger with the defeat of the dark threat looming on Europa, to which she says, you got stasis. All right, cool. Use it up, big guy. I then talk to the Drifter to see what insightful ideas he has for me, to which he says, that power looks good. Good on you, kid. Real snappy. Bring those fancy new powers through Gambit sometime, huh? So fucking good. I return to the Ziggy to commune with the darkness one final time. I love this design for the Black Fleet way more than the Witness. While Rolk does look badass, there's no denying that. There's something about these haunting veiled figures that look so much more dark and mysterious than the Pixar villain we got with the Witness. Time. Oh, he's ugly, ugly. My <laughs> balls so big, I would just poke him. Comes up to you, he's like. <laughs> <laughs> Hit him with the see-through <laughs> eye blind. I was like, he looks so cool. Then he turned around, I'm like, aww. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you. Why does they pick such a cute enemy, you know? <laughs> Maybe like shrink his eyeballs a little bit. Just a little bit. The witness is coming. 
And he's fucking adorable. Ready to give him the white gear treatment when he shows up in my Thunderdome. The last part of the Beyond Light quest involves a debrief with Zavala. I return to the tower at a beautiful time of day. Many challenges have taken me to this point. There's something beautiful in the way the Traveler sits above the city as a silent protector beyond our understanding. I debrief with Zavala and with the banner at the bottom, signifying the end. I beat Beyond Light with only a powered melee. What a beautiful morning to end this saga on, with my hunter back from the dead, and the Kell of Darkness uprising defeated. I feel as though just like this morning, it is a new beginning. I can even begin challenge runs in the Witch Queen now with my hunter, to give my hunter mains out there some love. And with this beautiful morning sunrise, I'd like to give a thanks to everyone on Patreon who makes these videos possible. I know I don't post too frequently, but when I do, I hope that I've done a good job on brighten your day, at least in the slightest. Huge thanks to Nathaniel Farmer, Curious Lich, CEO Camo 3, Arson is Cringe, Rin Hale, Crimbo the Undying, Madeline Celestia, Some Dude with a Scarf, Bogos Binted, Super Steven, Mondo117, James Escalante. Jams Escalante? I don't know anymore. Brighton, Omega Null, Samarchi Desk Hopper, Nand, Lost the Bob, Xavier Human, and Fufu Akio. I know I'm like a ghost most of the time, but honestly, I am extremely thankful for anything that gets sent my way, even every little message. I also want to give a special thanks to Gamer Weenus. But with all that being said, on the dawning of tomorrow, and with Aramis chilling in my mini fridge, I've been Riley. Thank you for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.